Hey guys. All right, if you have your Bibles with you, turn over to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. We're going to get into that momentarily. Now, I've got a big question for you. I want you to really think about it. How many in the room have issues in your life? I'm so proud of you, man. That's so, hey, if you have issues in your life, you came to the right church this weekend. Because we all, I mean we, us, together, we all have issues in our life. And here's what I want to talk to you about. And this is what I've noticed again in these 26 plus years of ministry. Everybody in this room, everybody has one major issue. Now, we all have a bunch of issues. We know that. If you, if, if you are, are concerned that you don't know what your issues are, guys, just ask your wife. She'll tell you all of them, okay? <laughs> Same thing happens vice versa. But listen now. Listen, this is important. I've never preached out of number six before. And I wanted to do this for a reason. Everybody in the room has an issue in your life that is strangling you, that is sucking the life right out of you. And at some point in this message, the Holy Spirit of God is going to reveal that to you. Something that just keeps you from being everything you can be for God. Something that keeps you from being able to live the life God wants you to live. And you're sharp people, you know exactly what it is. And it can be a number of things. And that one issue that just about the time you think you're about to be right where you want to be with God, and you think you've conquered this, guess what? There it is. Rears its ugly head, and you go right back to square one. Whatever this issue is, you'll take two gigantic steps forward, and then all of a sudden, when you think you've conquered it, you'll go three steps backward. It can be something as simple as an unforgiving spirit. Maybe your mother-in-law said something to you years ago, and you think you've dealt with it and you've forgiven, but then she says something a few weeks later, and boom, it's all back. Somebody that you just can't forgive, and you think, man, if I could just forgive this person, my life would be so much better. And you know what? You're right. It could be an addiction to alcohol, pornography, drug addiction. It could be a number of things. You think you've licked it. You think you're on top of it. But about the time that you're about to make great strides and, you know, you've, you've, you've crossed the great divide and you're, you know you're about to be with God the way you should be with God and your spirituality is going to be at an all-time high and you've just made it over the hump and now your life is going to be that life that you've wanted, then guess what happens? Boom! It comes back. And there you are and you get depressed and you get defeated and you've seen so many pastors, you spend spent so much time reading the Bible and praying. But you just, listen, there are some issues that don't go easily. And sometimes they stay with you your entire life. And even if somebody points them out to you, deep down deep inside you may defend yourself, but you know it's there. Now here's what's scary about that. And this is the scariest part of all. Everybody has questions they want to ask God when they get to heaven. Here's mine. Why is it that the devil knows exactly what that one issue is? James 1.14. I mean, I'd like that. God, you know, I, it's bad enough you have the goods on me. Why does he have to have the goods on me too? And guess what he does? He hones in on that one area. And just about the time you're about to be all you can be for God, just about the time your life is about to even out and it's just nothing but downhill smooth sailing from there, guess what happens? That one issue in your life, he's brilliant at just bringing it back and making you feel guilty and convicting you and just sucking the life and the joy right out of you. Now, I've been in ministry, like I said, 26, 27 years, and I've never met a person who didn't have that one issue that they just wish they could overcome. And it's not like they don't want to overcome it. I mean, they want to be better. They want to stop being so bitter. They want to forgive their ex-husband. They want to forgive the ex-wife. They want to forgive their kids. They want to forgive God because there's something that God didn't give them they thought they had the right to have. Or there's something in their life that God did not intervene in when they felt like God should have intervened. They want to be happy. They want to be joyful. They don't want to be bitter. They really don't want to be angry. And they have seasons where they conquer it, but just about the time that everything's going well, boom, and they're right back to square one. There are so many things in life that are easy to grab onto, hard to let go. Now, 
We all have them, I have them, you have them. And I, I wondered a lot, why, why is it that we have the power of God in us to overcome all things? Why are there some things we don't seem to be able to conquer? I mean, are we weak? Is it our fault? What's going on? I believe that every Old Testament narrative has a direct correlation to the good news of the gospel. And if you'll be patient, I mean, if you came here this weekend, you thought, man, I need a good nap. I'm going to take it during the sermon. It was the wrong weekend to do that. <laughs> because truth is learned best when there's tension rather than when information is just dispensed. So I'm not going to stand here and just dispense information this weekend. I'm going to take you through this powerful narrative. And if you'll go with me through it, guess what's going to happen at the end? You're going to have what I believe to be the biblical answer of how you can finally be free of this thing, how the shackles could be broken. And you're going to go, I got it now. It's going to happen. It's a reality. I finally found out. No one ever preached on this passage when I was growing up. No one. I never heard one sermon on it. And now here we are. And I believe we're going to get free. I think some good things are going to happen, but you've got to go through the text. Will you do that with me? And I'll do it as fast as possible. I'll even talk even faster. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1, here's what the Lord said to Moses. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite. Now, I have to stop there because I have to identify and define two words. The first is special. It's the word, very difficult word in Hebrew, but it's pronounced fillet, like fillet of fish. Sorry, that's how it's pronounced. And it means something that is special. It means something that is extraordinary. It's combined with this idea of the Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite, I mean, what does that mean? Somebody who came from Nazareth? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Nazarite comes from two ideas from the Hebrew word nazir. And nazir refers to two things. One, a head covering, which we're going to get into in a moment. And two, a head covering that sets you apart. So that's what a nazir is, head covering that sets you apart. When it's combined with this word fillet that means special or extraordinary, here's what we have, a vow that involves doing extraordinary things so that something extraordinary might be done to you and in you. You got it? So the person who enters the vow is desperate. They tried every means and measures possible. They come to God and they make an extraordinary vow, which means they're going to do something extraordinary in their lives so that God would do something extraordinary in theirs. Now, let me show you the way, just quickly, two other instances where fillet is used in the Bible. In Judges 13, we meet a man by the name of Manoah. It doesn't matter who he is. It's not, about, it's not the point of the story. But whoever he is, he takes a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing. Now, guess what word that is? It's the word fillet. So now it's interpreted or translated amazing. First special, now amazing. What was the amazing thing? Verse 20, as the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Well, that's pretty amazing. You have an offering and then the flame goes up and the angel of the Lord ascends. So now we have the idea of something amazing. That's what fillet means. Something special, extraordinary, something amazing. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 77, David uses the word, and he says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. And guess what word miracles is? Filet. So we have something special, something extraordinary, and now we have something miraculous. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew word for telephone is filet phone, a miracle phone, because it's a miraculous thing to be able to talk to each other the way we do. Miraculous extraordinary, special, so that the person who makes the Nazarite vow, there's something in their lives that they just don't seem to be able to shake, so they come to God and they say, I'm going to do something extraordinary, God, that you might do something extraordinary, outstanding, miraculous, wondrous in me. Now, there are three components to the vow. Here's the first one. You find it in verse 3. They must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. And they must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. So the first component, if you're going to enter into the vow, is no wine. That's not a big thing to you and me, is it? Oh, we can cut out wine. But folks, wine among these people, it was like they had wine to celebrate everything. I mean, they drank wine to celebrate drinking wine. 
They loved wine. It was a central component of their culture. Every Friday when the sun went down and the Sabbath was ushered in, they brought it in by drinking wine. Every national holy day or holiday, they did so, ushering it in by drinking wine. It was the way of life. Now, I just attended uh, my niece's wedding on Friday night out at Etta Wanda Gardens. And doesn't she look gorgeous? She looks gorgeous. And this guy's not so bad, too, actually. And <laughs> this guy over here, no. I enjoyed the wedding because I didn't have to do anything. Usually, you know, you have to perform the ceremony and I got to worry about everything. But this was one of those weddings I just didn't have any role, really. And I just got to enjoy the food and the preaching and everything else that surrounded it. But, you know, I've lived in New Zealand and I've lived in Zimbabwe and I've lived in Georgia and I've lived in California. Those are four different cultures, especially Georgia. Now, that's a culture of its own. And every culture has different traditions when it comes to weddings and funerals and celebration. And it just made me think of this text I'd been studying all week and how in the Jewish culture, man, wine, a huge part of culture. Even when they celebrated the Passover, they celebrated with four cups of wine. Now, it was only one cup, but they filled it four times. What a celebration. To remember the four promises that God had made the Israelites. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to redeem you. And I'm going to bring you to myself. So that Jesus, when he celebrates the Passover with the disciples, drinks from the third cup, the cup of redemption, right? Now, why do I go through all that? Because the per listen now, <laughs> man, you've got to go through this. The person who has decided that they need God to act and respond in an extraordinary way to help them shake something they've not been able to shake, radically alters the typical way of life. They change something that they believe to be unchangeable, something that is so much part of them. For you and me, it's not like giving up chocolate or giving up dessert. This would be like giving up food, period. Think about it. We in America, we celebrate everything with what? Food, 4th of July, food, Christmas, food, Thanksgiving, food. Let's have some food. <laughs> You're saying that I'm going to radically alter my life and that when I get these invitations to wine tasting parties, I'm going to say no. When there's festivities, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, but I decline to go. Moreover, wine was the symbol of joy. So you're going to give up something that is central to the enjoyment of your life. As a matter of fact, in verse 3b, we're told, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or skins. So you not only can't have wine, you can't have grapes and no chocolate raisins. You can't have anything. The person who's serious about the vow. Number one, no wine. Number two, don't cut your hair. Now there's some children around here saying, see, Dad, I told you, it's right there in the Bible. Don't cut your hair. Verse 5 says, during the entire period of the Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. Now, this is, stay with me, this is beautiful imagery here. I can't go through the whole thing of the Nazarite vow, but why the long hair? Why, why can't you touch your head with a razor? Most of us seem to think that in the Old Testament times, everybody had long hair. Not true. They had longish hair, but we're now talking about a time when you will go through a vow that you don't touch your head with a razor, which means your hair's growing long and your beard, your face, your hair, everything's just growing out. Now, the reason they did this is because when you met a person who looked like this, you knew exactly what they were doing. Wow, here's a guy or a girl that's taking the Nazarite vow. Now, I didn't say the ladies had beards and mustaches. I'm just saying <laughs> that if you're taking the Nazarite vow, you're, you, when you meet someone, you're saying, wow, look at this. This is impressive. It's a glorious sight. So that they can hold you accountable. If they saw the outward demonstration of your vow, they're not going to come over to you and invite you to a wine tasting party. They're going to hold you accountable. They're going to support you in the vow that you've made. And they're going to say, look, remember, you've made this vow. You need God's extraordinary activity in your life. You need to shake loose of this thing that's binding you. Stay the course. But there's a second reason. When this whole vow, the entire vow is consecrated, when it's consecrated, at the end, when you come to the tent of meeting and it's all over, the season has drawn to an end, God made it clear that he wanted something from your body. You're going to give something from yourself. And because God is a kind God and a gentle God, he didn't want you to have to cut your arm off. So what you do is you grow the hair so that it becomes such a part of you, so that the part of you that you give 
is when you come to the tent of meeting, the first thing they do is shave all the hair off, gather it up, and burn it on the sacrificial altar as the sign that you are giving part of you to God. But the Nazarite vow went farther than that because what it spoke, what it communicated was this, that God was able to take something from you while at the same time making you stronger. You got it? That God was able to take something from you while at the same time making you stronger. Number one, don't drink wine. Number two, don't cut your hair. Number three, don't go near the dead body. Verse six, throughout the entire period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body. Even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. Now, here's what happens. When you grow the long hair, it becomes a sign of your purity. And you don't want your purity to be defiled in any way, so you don't go around anything that would make you unclean. Now, for you and me, we think, oh, I could do that. I mean, I could abstain from wine, and I could not cut my hair. Matter of fact, I'd love to not cut my hair, and I, I could not go near dead bodies. But hold on a second. Remember, we're in a time when there were no ambulances, when there were no hospices, when there were no hospitals. And here's kind of an indication of the way the family lived in the 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 BC. They were all together in this one compound. And the extended family, imagine this, that you've got mom and dad, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, mother-in-law. Everybody's on the same compound. And the truth is you were born into this, you lived in this, and you died in this. And so it was your responsibility when one, like when great-grandpa, who would be living in the same compound, died, it was your responsibility to help carry his body and give him a proper burial. Death was an everyday almost part of life. When you had the extended family living together, you had so many cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody right here. I mean, imagine living just across the courtyard from your mother-in-law. That to me is miraculous in and of itself, that more people didn't die earlier. And so if somebody dies, your responsibility is to carry the body. Again, it's the same thing. It's the whole idea that if you're going to enter into this vow with God, that you are going to radically change, radically alter the way you've been living. And what has been commonplace to you is no longer going to be common. That for a season, you're going to give those things up. Now, how long did the vow last? Well, look at verse 5. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. Now, that doesn't really tell us a lot, does it? How long does the vow last? until the period of dedication to the Lord is over. In other words, it ain't over till it's over. But how long? Now, here's what we know about the Nazarite vow. The people who took them, number one, they were desperate. They'd come to the end of the rope. There was an illness that they needed God to get involved in. There was a depression. There was anxiety. There was something going on in their lives they just couldn't conquer. They couldn't shake, and they wanted to shake, so they came to God. And the duration of the vow directly corresponded to how bad they wanted God's involvement. How desperate are you? And so we have historical references of people entering into the vow for 30 days, 90 days, one year, three years. And we even have a historical reference of someone entering into the Nazarite vow for seven years. Seven years of not growing your hair. Seven years, rather, of not lay, allowing a razor to touch your hair. Seven years of no wine. Seven years of no dead body. Seven years where you dramatically alter what is commonplace to your life. And the question always associated with the Nazarite vow was, how badly do you want to overcome what's plaguing you? How badly do you want to shake loose what's binding you? How badly do you want to free yourself of what's strangling you and sucking the life right out of you? Now, do I still have you? You've done well. Stay with me. Stay with me. When I was in New Zealand, uh, I was in my early 30s, and there was a pastor from another church that started coming to the church that I pastored. And I was doing expository teaching through the book of James in this season of ministry, and he was coming every Sunday night to hear and to listen, and then he would go away to his church the next Sunday morning, preach, and then come back to our church on Sunday night. He was twice my age, and I grew to love and respect this guy. We started spending some time together, and then I noticed the season in his life when things seemed to not be going well, and I was really concerned for him. And then one day after church, he says, Pastor Jeff, you got five minutes. Now, I always know five minutes is 30. He said, do you have some time? I said, sure, come on in, man, let's talk. 
And he got down on his knees, this guy that's twice my age, and began to just weep. And he said, Jeff, can you help me? I'm thinking, whoa, can you help me? I've had this thing in my life for 30 years, and it's finally caught up to me. It's destroying me. It's destroying my marriage. It's going to destroy my ministry. If I don't get hold of this man, I'm telling you, it's going to ruin everything. Can you help me? And I said, well, can you tell me what it is? No, he said. I said, why? He said, that's not important what it is. I just need you to tell me that God is going to lead you to give me some advice here. That's a lot of pressure. We prayed together, and then I told him to do what I've told many people to do before, no matter what age. I said, if there's something in your life that is destroying you, and you're desperate, and you've tried to overcome it through prayer, and through devotion, and through counseling, and still you don't seem to be able to break hold of the shackles, here's my advice. Take something in your life that you really, really love, something that's common to you, something that is a part of your everyday life, and say to God, I am not going to do this again until I have conquered this issue. He heard me say that, and remember, I'm in my young 30s, so I'm not that smart either. And he's thinking, that's it. And you can tell it, something dawned on him, and he just ran out of the office. I saw him a week later, he looked terrible. I saw him two weeks later, he looked worse. I saw him the third week, he looked like Gandhi. I'm not saying anything bad about Gandhi, but just imagine what Gandhi looked like. He looked like Gandhi. And I thought, okay, if he comes back next week and he's still going downhill, i got to have a talk with him. He came back the fourth week, but this time... He didn't look as bad, and it looked like as he had made a turn for the better. And he came up to me after the service, Jeff, you got five minutes, which I knew meant 30 minutes. And he came into the office and he said, Jeff, and you could just see the whew on him. You could see the relief. You could see the victory all over his face. And I wish I could tell you I've got a thousand stories like this, but I don't. I only have one, and this is it. And he said, it worked. I said, what worked? He said, I gave up the thing that I love the most. I said, what was that? He said, food. He gave up food for a month. And I would never advise you to do that. I mean, you need medical supervision, but that's what he decided to do without asking anybody. I just said, I am not going to eat until I've conquered this thing. I said, well, how did it go? He said, Jeff, the first week it was devastating. Second week it was, I thought I was going to die. And then the third week I settled down and God showed me something. And it was so clear and when I saw this whole situation through the eyes of God, I knew never again would I be tempted and I'd be able to conquer it. Jeff, I've been healed. It's fantastic. And I said to him, tell me what God showed you. And he said, no. <laughs> and I said, why? It was my idea. <laughs> and he said, because if I showed you, you would not understand. And I thought about that. At first I was angry, then I thought, he's dead right. Because God works individually with us. And what he does in one life doesn't make it normative for every life. He meets you where you are and what you need to see. And what you need to see may make no sense to me at all. Now I want you to keep that in mind as I finish the completion of this vow. In verse 13, now this is the law of the Nazarite when the period of their dedication is over. They are to be brought to the entrance to the tent of meeting. They are then to present their offerings to the Lord. Now stay with me. This is so extravagant here. There's a list. Think about it. No wine. You didn't cut your hair. You're not going through a dead body. You've radically altered the way of common day living. And now here's what you're told to do when all that's over. You're told to bring all these things to the tent of meeting and to sacrifice them on the altar to God. And the list starts out with a year old lamb, a ram without defect, grain offerings, drink offerings, a basket of bread without yeast, cakes made with fine flour, mixed with oil, wafers spread with extravagant oil, thick loaves of bread. The list goes on and on. And scholars look at this and they say, wait a minute, this can't be right because this is an extravagant list. Nobody could afford all this in these days and times. And even if you could afford it, you'd have to have a huge cart and help from a bunch of people to load all this up and get it all the way to the tent of meeting on top of the hill and give it to the priest. Which meant this, scholar said, if you're going to be able to take the Nazarite vow, it's very clear from what is written that you're going to need something. You know what you're going to need? Community, friends, and family who are going to stand behind you the whole time saying, you can do it. You can do it. And then they're so into your vow and want you to succeed that they themselves are willing to sell some of their stuff so that you can have what it takes on this cart to bring it 
to the sacrificial meeting. Scholars tell us that this stuff, this list is the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars in today's world. It's like you bringing your timeshare and your, your second or third car, mortgaging your house, giving your seasoned Dodger or Angel tickets, which you could probably give away right now. <laughs> and you bring it all and you offer it and you're expecting God then to move in a powerful way. And you could not accomplish it unless you had friends who believed in what you were doing, who were there to support you, who held you accountable, and were willing to celebrate at the end. Now, stay with me. Man, this is so good. Just stay right here. It, try to picture in your mind's eye, and I wish I was better at this, but I'm not. Try to focus now on what was happening. Here comes this long-haired guy. We're going to call him Shaggy. He's walking up the hill to the tent of meeting. He's tired, man. He's given up so much, and he's got this whole big group of people behind him that love him and are pulling for him. He's pulling this cart up to the tent of meeting. He's sacrificed so much, and the only thing he has left to his name now is what? His hair. The only thing he has left that he can call his is my hair. This is mine. And it's the first thing to go when he arrives at the tent of meeting. Then at the entrance to the tent, as he arrives, the first thing he does, the Nazarite must shave off the hair that symbolizes their dedication. They are to take the hair and put it in the fire that is under the sacrifice of the fellowship offering. The priest shall then wave these before the Lord as a wave offering. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. You see what's going on? Scholars struggle with this whole idea of the wave offering. Some scholars believe it's saying goodbye, bye-bye. But, but it's, it's not so much that as it is waving the aroma up to God of a life that has said, I'm so desperate. I'm in such need, I can't shake this issue. And it stands between me and my God. God, do something extraordinary in me, please. Something miraculous, something special. And they bring all of this. They shave the head in public arena. They put it on the sacrificial altar. Now listen, by the age of 13, you're a young boy or young girl in the Jewish culture, the Hebrew culture, by the age of 13, you've got the entire Torah memorized. The first five books of Moses, you've memorized the whole thing. And you've heard about these people who make the Nazarite vow, but you've never actually met one. And then one day your dad says, hey, we're going to go to the tent of meeting today and you're going to meet someone special. And you've heard that there are people who are so passionate about God doing something extraordinary in their lives that they're willing to stop doing something that's ordinary in everyday life. You've heard about that there are people who are so passionate about God doing something life-changing that they're willing to alter significantly their lives, and that they're so desperate for God to do something supernatural in them that they are willing to give up something that's so natural to them. And then one day, you go to the temple, and here's this long-haired dude, and he comes in, and you watch the priest shave all the hair off and take all of these offerings, and here's this man who gets down on his knees, and he looks broken, he looks shattered, and yet when all of this is accomplished, he lifts his face to heaven, and his eyes are open. And it's a picture of discipline, but it's a picture of joy and celebration. And all of his friends are there with him, and they applaud. And they're right there in his corner saying, you did it, you did it. And God kept his promise. He did something extraordinary in your life. And then the text ends by this famous verse, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now, Almost over. You've done so well. I'm so proud. Why did I take you through this? Now, this is the part you need to wake up if you're asleep. Because in every single one of your lives, in my life, there is that one thing that if you could just conquer, I'm telling you, you would be catapulted across the great divide and your life would change. The joy that would come in, the conquering spirit, the overcoming attitude, the abundant life, it would all just change dramatically. But unfortunately, these things do not go easily. And it takes more than just having some prayer time. Sometimes it takes more than the pastor's prayer or somebody that has the anointing praying over you. It takes more than that to shake the unshakable. Now, 
It was Father's Day last weekend, and I told the story about my dad, and I, I've just been thinking a lot about my dad, and I was thinking about the time again when we lived in the Brandy Chase Apartments up in Cincinnati, and my father actually made the drive to come and see Delaney, his grandson, for the first time, six and a half hours away. And on the way to the house, I told dad about old Sam, and old Sam was a catfish, a carp that lived in the pond in front of the Brandy Chase Apartments. And all the residents hated him because he was wreaking havoc on the pond. You know, catfish, barbels, they can do amazing things, and they're usually not good. And my dad said, well, why don't you just catch him and throw him out? And I said, guys, all the guys have tried to catch him, Dad, and they can't catch him, and they're so frustrated. I said, well, hire a company to come down. He said, no, they don't want to do that. They just want to fish him out. My dad said, have you seen him? I said, yeah, he's ugly. You know, he's about this big. Now, my dad is a lot like me in this sense. I don't go anywhere without my golf clubs. I just don't. Nowhere. I go to Africa, I got my golf clubs. I go to India, I got my golf clubs. I don't care where I'm going, I've got my golf clubs. I don't go anywhere, so don't ever ask me, do you have your clubs? You know the answer already. My dad is the same way with his fishing gear. My dad's an old southern boy that fishes every stream he can, most of which are illegal. <laughs> but he doesn't think you should ever be charged for fishing. God made this river and he's fishing, this is my fish. Now, he's never been caught. One day I, I was expecting to get him out of jail, but he never got caught. Wherever he decided to fish, if he was just driving on a trip and he saw a river lake, he was there. But my dad was a good fisherman. And I could just hear him saying under his breath, these northerners, they don't know how to catch up. This is ridiculous. So he stopped the car even before he'd seen his grandson. He stops the car by the pond. We're not even home yet. Goes around to the back, opens the truck. There's this horde of fishing gear. And this scene starts to develop where the people in the office start to come out on the veranda there and watch this whole thing unfold. People in the Brandy Chase apartments heard there was some old guy out in the pond. They all come out and watch. So my dad, with a big old smile on his face, and you had to know my dad, this big Barney Five type smile, and he gets this bait, goes over, and I watch him sprinkle, I think it's corn, but I saw him sprinkle something right on top of the water where he was going to throw his line in, and he threw it in. I'll bet you that he called old Sam in about a minute. And you got to know my dad. He reels him in, holds him up. Standing ovation. Everybody's applauding. My dad's standing under his breath. These foreigners, they got no idea. These are from the north, Dad. They're not foreigners. These northerners, they got no idea. And he held it up and they all clapped. And if you know my dad, you know what happens next. He threw him back in and got back in the car. <laughs> that's, that's, you got to know my dad. I think about that story all the time because my dad taught me a lesson. My dad knew exactly what bait to use. And I'm trying to tell you that why I don't know, but the reality according to Scripture is that evil one has the goods on you. And that one issue in your life, he's going to hone in on it at those seasons of your life when you're about to make progress and you're about to go into the abundant life. The whole time I've been preaching this weekend, there's been something on the screen behind me. Do you know what that is? It's called a strangler fig, and it grows in tropical forests. Do you know what it does? Birds will come and drop the seeds down onto the ground. And those seeds will actually take root. And they will get the nourishment. And then this fig will find a host tree. And it will start to surround the tree and wrap itself around it. And year after year, it will begin to strangle it and suck the life right out of it until it kills the tree and takes its place. And I'm telling you, that's exactly what's happening in a lot of your lives that there's something you grabbed hold of. There's something that happened in you, and it was a seed that started to grow, and it's been strangling you for years, but you're too doggone stubborn to admit it. You're a little rebel inside. You think you're strong enough to defeat it, and over time, it's replaced you. You're not even the real you anymore. It's possessed you. It's wrapped itself around you. It's sucked the marrow, the life out of you and you don't know what to do, and you're not strong enough to do it on your own, it is going to take something radical. It could be envy, bitterness, jealousy. It could be your need for approval. It could be your march towards significance. It could be anything. And only you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, knows what it is. It could even be something like infertility. Infertility. That you're thinking, why would God not give me a child? I mean, he said, go forth, be fruitful, and multiply. We're trying. God, why? I don't understand. And that seed starts to grow in you. And over time, you get further and further from God. You're separated. It's strangling the life out of you. There's no vitality to your spirituality. You're not living the life because you just don't know why God didn't deliver. Whew. 
And the devil knows what that one thing is. And he's going to keep smacking you with it, smacking you with it. Every time you get close to living the abundant, free life Jesus came to bring. Now, folks, I believe that there's a remedy. I believe that we can contextualize the Nazarite vow. I'm calling on everybody in the room to remember that the underlying theme of the Nazarite vow was this, how bad do you want to change? How far would you go to get God involved and to bring something special, miraculous, extravagant, extraordinary? And if that's where you are, because if you're not there, okay, you heard a good lit message, you know, interesting about numbers, go on with your life. But if that's where you are, I'm going to challenge you to take an oath. And the oath includes three things. Number one, sacrifice something meaningful. There is only one thing in my life that if I was serious about getting God involved that I could sacrifice, what would it be? That's right. See, it's interesting how all of you knew that. Because I talk about it all the time. See, it can't be chocolate or coffee. It's got to be something that's so central to my life, I'm saying for a season, I'm going to deny myself this thing. I don't know what it's meaningful in your life, but whatever that central thing is. Now remember, husbands, wives, you can't sacrifice your wife, kids. No, no, that, that's off limits. Okay, you can't do one thing by violating another biblical principle. There's nothing violating a biblical principle by giving up golf, though, is there? Please. If you want to take the vow, sacrifice something meaningful. Second, change something about yourself. We gave you these bracelets when you come in. It could be something as simple as wearing this bracelet so that when people see you, they know, hey, you're in the middle of a vow, and I'm going to respect that. Share the vow with your inner circle. Let them know what it is so they don't tempt you into that area so that they can be your encouragers behind you saying, you can do it. You can do it sacrifice and change something about yourself. It could be anything. You could grow your hair. You could cut your hair off. I don't care what it is, but do something that's between you and God. Third, offer something to God that is so valuable that there's no way you can do it on your own. You're going to need your friends to help you. Now, when I first started doing this, I thought, I'll tell, I know what we'll do. I'll have them write this vow and then bring their offering to God. Then I thought, no, nope, don't want to do that because there's always going to be somebody that says, oh, this is just another ploy to somehow get more money into the church. No, as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, don't do that. If you decide that there's something that's going to cost you a lot, do not bring it to the church. Give it to somebody you know at workplace or in your community that's in need. Maybe God will lead you to help somebody get into an apartment or pay an electric bill or do something, but help them do that. Now, I want you to take a look at this. Here's the beauty of this passage. Jesus came from the town of what? Nazareth. Nazareth is a derivative of Nazir. Jesus came from Nazareth because he's the ultimate in taking the Nazarite vow. Every Old Testament narrative leads to the truth of the gospel. Can I ask you something? What huge thing did God need to overcome? Your sin and mine. Because ultimately he wants a relationship with us. And guess what Jesus did? He entered into the ultimate Nazarite vow. Did he sacrifice something meaningful? The Bible said he didn't have a place to lay his head. The creator, sustainer of the universe doesn't have a place to sleep. He gets hungry. He gets tired. He gave up something meaningful. Did he change something about himself? Philippians 2. He took on the form of man. God took on the form. He changed his appearance. And in appearance, he looked as if he were a man. And he took on the nature of a bondservant and made his way to the cross for you and me. Did he offer something to God? Oh, duh. His life. He gave his life so that you and I could go free. He's the ultimate Nazarite. He took the ultimate vow. And guess what happened? When the consummation or completion occurred, when he came to the great tent of meeting and he offered himself on the cross and everything he had, what was the next move? The Bible says he seated at the right hand of the Father. He saw the face of God. And I'm telling you, if you enter into this vow and you keep that vow, sooner or later along the path, you will see God. And you will see your situation through the eyes of God, and it will give you strength and power to overcome. Is anybody in?
So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to write down your own vow. I'm not going to tell you what that is. I can. Get a three by five card. Get something. Not now. I want to give you a week to do it. Write your vow. What you're going to give up. What you're going to change about yourself. What you're going to offer to God that you can't offer unless you have your friends help you. And then next week I'm going to have the cross here. And I'm going to ask you to bring your vow and put it at the foot of the cross. No one's going to read those, but you're going to leave them there. And then on September the 29th, I'm asking you this to be a 90-day vow. And on September the 29th, on Sunday night in this place, we're all going to come together for a worship experience, a one-hour worship experience, and we're going to celebrate the consummation of your vow to God. And then I can't wait to start reading the emails of the stories of how God revealed himself to you, and you know what it now is to be more than a conqueror. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the vow. For what was going to come, he endured this season of radically changing his life. Jesus does. And now he's on the right hand of the Father. And now the sin that so easily entangles us and tries to choke the life out of us, if we'll go into the vow and endure what is required, knowing that the joy that is set before us will put us on the right hand of the Father, you too will overcome. It's your call. Father, thank you so much for the power of Numbers chapter 6. I, I thank you that you revealed to us the power of the vow anytime we enter into a covenant with you. Father, we know this is not something to manipulate you. We know this is not something to coerce you in doing what we want you to do, rather it is an experience into which we enter where we believe that you will do something extraordinary in us, that you'll do something special, something miraculous, something amazing, where we will learn what it is to be an overcomer. I pray desperately for the people in this room that have, they know what their issue is. It might be an illness. It might be they want their marriage to be restored. It might be they want their children to come home. It might be that they just want this one thing to go away, to dissipate, or at least to conquer it and live above those circumstances, I pray, encourage them to make the vow and give them the sign and give them the vision. Give them a Jesus revelation where they can be seated in community with God and see this whole situation through your eyes is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.